You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On today's show, we'll focus on the healthcare system here in Nigeria. We'll assess the opportunities for health maintenance organizations in the country, plus more. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets. You can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther O. Awuni. Now, while Nigeria's healthcare system has a lot of potential for growth, we we'll find out how the health maintenance organization segment of the market is coping with the current realities. Simbo Ukiri, CEO of Avon HMO, joins me for this discussion. Simbo, thank you so much. Pleasure to have you on the show today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. We were talking offline uh, just before we came on about how complicated Nigeria's healthcare system seems or can be sometimes. And I told you that I've had other guests here from the, from the sector, and they also allude to that fact that, look, it's, it's fragmented, many players and it would, would, it would appear that uh, the roles of every each player in the ecosystem may not be clearly spelt, spelt out. But I want to hear your perspective. Nigeria's healthcare system, help us break it down, help us understand it. Okay, um, you, you have to basically first split it into two sides. So you have the delivery side and then you have the access side. So on the delivery side you have um, hospitals, you have clinics, you have diagnostic centers, you could even have pharmacies. These are the people that actually deliver the healthcare services for a price, of course, at a cost. And then you have people like ourselves, the health maintenance organizations, health insurance companies, if you want to call us that, given financial access to all these services on the delivery side. And um, also you have somewhere in there, you have um, what I would call, um, also on the delivery side, the, the, the manpower okay. through which the industry, you know, provides these services and you know how many of them we have available. You have the doctors, the nurses, you have the specialists, you have the midwives, etc. etc. Um, some people like to take the value chain of the, the pharmaceutical value chain out of that and treat it differently, but I would rather add it to the delivery side and say that's part of you know the services and the products that are being delivered that people then consume. And then of course you have the consumers as well. You can have them as individuals who are looking to access healthcare services on their own. You can have them as corporate organizations who are which, you know, looking for how to provide access to, to healthcare services for their staff and the members of their family. And sometimes communities come together, associations, or okay. you can even have um, villages or a town or an area coming together to say, look, we want healthcare cover, and how can we access it, you know, kind of uh, as a group. And understanding what drives each of these, you know, parties, and understanding also, um, not just what drives them, but, but their needs and what their obligations are, and having that clearly spelt out and understood, and knowing that each needs to be looked out for in the ecosystem in a way that ensures that their needs are being met and that they continue to be viable and sustainable in the future. Okay. You know, I think that's, that's where the challenge is. Okay, now, but there's also a regulator, the National Health Insurance Scheme, uh, and uh, it, I, I know it has some kind of partnership with the HMOs where it takes a, a certain percentage of salaries of, of civil servants and then the, the, that pa passes it, it's passed on to the HMOs who provide these services to the civil servants, if, if I'm correct, at least basic, <laughs> basically. You, you so, kind of have so, what, so what is the problem, what, what is the, what, where is the breakdown, the link between the, the NHIS and the HMOs? Because okay. as we speak, insurance penetration is still very, very abysmal. Yeah. Many people still pay out of pocket and that just defeats the whole aim of having this scheme in the first place. Yeah, so I'll, I'll break it down a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, so you have um, the NHIS, the National Health Insurance Scheme, as a plan, as a scheme in itself, okay. which was provided for the federal civil servants and still exists. Actually, it accounts for more than 90% of the total covered population as at today in Nigeria. So HMOs work with NHIS to administer that scheme to the federal civil servants. But over and beyond that, HMOs also have their own health plans which they designed and priced, which they offer to private individuals and companies as well, and communities to subscribe onto. So you have the NHIS being a regulator of the Federal Civil Servants Health Plan, as well as being a regulator of all the private health plans that okay. HMOs also offer onto the public. Now, the challenge is that outside of the Federal Civil Servants population, which has been stagnant, more or less, you know, since inception, there's been very little growth on the private health plans being offered to the mass market. Now, at a point over the period, the NHIS also attempted to come up with a plan 
for private, private individuals okay. beyond the federal civil servants, but that never really took off. You know, so I mean, the, the challenge still remains. How do we make health insurance widely acceptable to, to the majority of Nigerians? And I mean, we've so always would it said, be a, a problem with the model? Getting the model right because I mean, if you look at this, a country like the U.S., only the U.S. has a you know, problem yes. uh, <laughs> getting it right. You know, just bringing everybody under that uh, the health scheme. But for Nigeria, how do we begin to get it right? I mean, I'm, I mean, I imagine that we will probably need to go back to the drawing table because there's so many challenges with the HMO system that we're running here. But what are, what are the conversations that you're having that we're seeing mm. in the in the space as to how we can get this right? Well, the first is from the regulatory environment. I mean, we do believe that we should, as a country, have health insurance to be made compulsory. Right now, the act that sets it up says that you know health insurance may be subscribed to. So it leaves employers the mm. opportunity of taking a decision not to arrange for health insurance for their staff. But you know, if if we have a regulatory environment that makes it compulsory for you to subscribe like, like to the, the pension, exactly, scheme. Okay. exactly. We believe that health insurance should also be something like that, that should be made compulsory for, for all Nigerians, you know, that employ other Nigerians to, to, to take into consideration when looking at the welfare package for the people that work for them and with them. That's one thing. We also believe that we need a stronger regulator who is going to focus on regulating. You know, having a, a regulator who at times, you know, the, the, what they do really gets blurred, you know, as having a regulator that's also an operator makes things not very clear. You know, um, if our regulator is properly set up to have the right level of oversight, is also properly set up and properly, you know, uh, capacitated with the right people so that we have the same level of attention banks get that pension mm -hmm. administrators get. That's what we would like to see. That would um, go a long way in ensuring that only the HMOs that are able to provide the services that are solvent enough, that have the right level of financial capability to invest in the business remain in it. So at, at the beginning, before the HMOs got set up, at the time when they were going to you know, get set up, you know, come into the system, what were the expectations on the part of the HMOs? Uh, now we're going a long way back. <laughs> Um, this was probably, I think, in 2006 or so when, when, when all of this started. I think the HMO's expectations in the beginning, don't forget that the early entrants into the sector were doctors who had their hospitals. Oh, okay. These were doctors who were managing their hospitals and came up with this idea of, you know, first from their hospitals, they had retainership relationships with both government parastatals, with companies, with other institutions. And then the retainership model is what then led them to, oh, there are HMO models in other parts of the world. Why don't we also, you know, do this? Did we copy a particular model? Did we take a leaf from another country, perhaps with similar statistics I, as ours? I, I don't think we did. Otherwise, we would have ended up with a much stronger framework okay. than we have now. <laughs> I think we, we probably just, you know, tried to develop something that the players at that time thought would be in the best interest given what they knew of the country and what they also wanted to achieve for themselves. Yeah. The original, um, would I say, the, the original people who drafted what we have now didn't look far beyond the, nat the federal government civil servants health insurance scheme. And that, I mean, according to the NHIS, that's just 1.5% of Nigerians are exactly, covered by the NHIS. Exactly. That's, so you, you <laughs> that's have state governments now who also haven't yet made any arrangement whatsoever for health insurance for their staff. Isn't that amazing? You know, so it's, it's something that I think we need to use regulation to correct. We need to ensure that every Nigerian is covered by a health insurance plan. But I want us to go, I, I still want to go into the nitty gritty of, I mean, HMOs, how it works. I mean, how, okay, then, how then the then entire plan, I mean, how an, an HMO, how you operate, how the, the relationship between the HMO, the hospital, and the, the person who's, you know, subscribing to it. Okay, so the way I like to explain this is to think of an HMO as somebody that just pulls resources and pulls risks together. So an HMO basically goes to a large number of people and say, look, you know, if you fell ill now, you had to put your hand in your pocket to treat yourself, you spent quite a bit of money. So why not give me just a little bit of money, less than what you would normally spend, and I will gather money from a lot of people. When I have that, I know you're all not going to fall ill at the same time or with the same ailment. So this pool of money will go towards treating any member of this pool that falls ill. It also doesn't discriminate because you are not individually underwritten for your risk. So if you are a 35-year-old woman who is of childbearing age, it doesn't mean you will pay more than an 18-year-old woman 
who is still in school and definitely doesn't want to have any babies yet. So it's a sort of welfareist type mm -hmm. of structure of providing financial access to healthcare services for people across all you know ages, gender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then on the other side, we then go as HMO to negotiate with the hospitals to say, okay, so normally you will charge X amount of money for this service or this procedure. But hey, look, I have this huge population. I can guarantee you consistent, steady revenue. Because when I use you, my people will come to you and to you only for this type of services. So give me a discount on your normal mm -hmm. you know, tariff for, for, for this kind of service or this kind of procedure. And not only that, I'm also going, you know what? You've trusted me to look after your health as an HMO. So I'm going to accredit these hospitals. I'm going to subject them to a quality test to be sure that they do have the required equipment, the required level of skills, the required capability to deliver on those healthcare services you are going to need. So when you go through me, not only will you be paying less, you are also assured of a quality that you cannot assure yourself of if you had gone on your, you know, on your own. So that is how we bring value to both okay. the individual and then the hospital. Okay, I asked that question because I wanted to make that as a starting point and then see how things, where things began to go wrong. Because mm -hmm. what we hear now is that many times there are no remittances. The hospitals don't pay the HMOs and vice versa. And then, you know, this money is just lost us. Somebody's owing so much. And then at the end of the day, the person who has put money into the scheme, that's a, the user, cannot get, uh, get the service in, a, in the first place. It's, 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 it's at what point would something go wrong? Yeah, I mean, it, it all boils down to regulation, like I said, because you can't have a regulator that just watches idly while HMOs don't pay the hospitals or the other healthcare facilities. But there will be a reason why the HMO is not paying. Exactly. I, I'm going to get to that okay, in a minute. Right. I, I started from the other end. Okay. So when it does happen, we expect the regulator to step in. Now, the reason why an HMO might not pay is because they are not financially able to do so, either because they have underpriced. So the premium you charge is a reflection of the cost of the services you're providing and the frequency at which those services occur. Okay. Now, I'm not an actuary, I have to confess, but <laughs> <laughs> actuaries do this for us, you see. So they, have, okay, they build okay. actuarial models, so they look at benefits, they look at the cost of services from the hospital ends, they look at what the hospitals are charging for drugs, for this, for that. They build all of that in probability of, I don't know how many people and how many thousands will have malaria, how many people will have, and the frequency of that. And then they arrive at a premium that we are supposed to charge. Now, quite often you find HMOs charging far less premium than this. And you mentioned that earlier on about the fragmentation because there's so many HMOs. And some are really desperate, you know, and they charge far less premium than they are meant to charge. And the end result of that is that you are unable to pay the claims. So when you don't charge the right premium, you cannot meet up with your claims payment. I'm just thinking, why would, wouldn't the HMO look across and say, okay, this is the industry standard, this is what ABC are charging, maybe like an, like an average, unless at least maybe something, maybe not that, but something very close to that. You would, would they charge far less because they want more patients? Yeah, you would, you would, you would think that wouldn't happen, but it, it does happen, you know, and what you then discover is that over time, the ability to keep up with their liabilities begins to, to, to get diminished. And that's why I wanted to bring the conversation really around to proper regulation. Because as HMOs, we are all under an obligation to submit our audited financial accounts okay. to, to the regulator. I mean, I, I would like to see someone, anybody, just go to a regulator and ask for the audited financial accounts of all the HMOs in the country. And somebody do a paper on that. And let's see solvency you know, you know, ratios that HMOs have in this country. Let's see their reserves. Let's see what kind of liabilities they're carrying. Let's see which HMOs really do have the financial capability to, to, to carry on this business. It was very interesting that Nikon a couple of weeks ago came up with a new Recap, way, recapitalization. yeah, recapitalization and a new way of supervising the, the operators in, in their industry that was going to be based on risks that those operators were carrying. Okay, Simba, we're going to take a short break. Thank, Thank you so much for your time so far. We'll take a short break and it's we'll be pleasure. right back to Pika from where we left off. I've been speaking to Simba Ukiri. She's the CEO of Avon HMO. We'll continue our discussion right after the break to join us again.
Welcome back to Beyond Markets. We're continuing our focus on the healthcare system here in Nigeria. And still with me in the studio is Simba Ukuri. She's the CEO of Avon HMO. Thank you so much for your time so far. It's so a you, talk, to be you here. talked a lot about what you would like the regulator, the NHIS, you know, what you'd like them to do in terms of doing more to better regulate in the, the system. And uh, incidentally, in sometime in June, the House of Representatives uh, Committee on uh, Healthcare Services did put together a two-day panel. Of course, NHIS was there, officials on NHIS were there, and HMOs also had representations, uh, representatives there also. And a lot was brought to the fore, and at the end of the day, recommendations were made. But what we gathered from that meeting, or from that, uh, from that two-day hearing, was the fact that the system obviously wasn't working and a lot of fingers were pointed at the HMOs and how they had failed in their responsibility. And certain recommendations were made. Let's talk through them. Five recommendations were made from that uh, panel. Uh, one, was it, one of it is that NHIS should hand the money for services directly to the hospitals. What do you think about that? I mean, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit, take a step back and okay. say that, you know, at, at during those two days, there were allegations being made not just against the HMOs, but also against the hospitals, the providers. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we had a lot of um, allegations being made against providers as well, that they were not providing the service, that even when they had received the funds, the services were not being provided. They were turning back and release. And there were a lot of allegations also being made against the regulator for not regulating. I mean, how do you come out and say you're being owed so much over so many years? What have you been doing? How have you been monitoring the system? And it's a good thing some of those recommendations were made because it has led to some positive developments. Um, the first one about paying hospitals directly is an it was virtually going to be impossible to do because the NHIS doesn't have the capacity to process claims yet. Um, this is something that HMOs have always done you know, and um, will continue to do for the foreseeable future, even on those federal civil servants, you know, health, 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 um, health plans that, that we talked about earlier on. So that is not happening. You know, the payments are still going through HMOs. Who are making payments as are due to the some hospitals? Of, some, of the, some of the HMOs. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still going through some of the HMOs, you know, who are. There's some HMOs that have been delisted over the years. Yeah, I was going to come to that. Now I mean, they, were, they, yeah. were, they had to take a second look and some, you know, were, were asked to step aside. Indeed, okay. indeed, indeed. Um, then another recommendation that was made also was for, you know, this reaccreditation and this investigation to go on. And that has been done. In fact, um, the reaccreditation process started, I think, November last year. Um, that led to what you then you know, talked about, about April, earlier on this year, almost 23 HMOs being delisted and some being allowed back and given more time in which to, to, to conclude the submission of whatever it was that they'd been found wanting on. Um, this has happened. I believe the exercise closed a couple of weeks ago or so. so all of us HMOs are waiting now to let the NHIS just make the announcement and let the, you know, the public know that these are the HMOs that have met the accreditation requirements because it doesn't do us all any good to have trust in the system shaken. You know, we, the regulator owes it, we the HMOs owes it, we owe it, oh, and, yeah. and, and the health providers also owe it to the system to put forward credible parties, you know, that can deliver on their promises and whose commitments Nigerians can go to sleep on. And at that meeting, uh, with that meeting, would you, would you say that the NHIS or all parties, especially on the, on the part of the NHIS, got to appreciate the problems as they were and say, okay, fine, regardless of what's going on, we're going to go forward and find a solution that's going to benefit everybody, especially, at, and I keep saying the last mile, that the person <laughs> yeah. who's going to demand the woman, uh, the child who's going to, who requires these uh, medical services, would you say that that was achieved? I believe so, because it's, it's, for me, it resulted in two crucial things. The first, like I said, is the reaccreditation exercise for the HMOs. I'm not saying there haven't been bad eggs within the HMOs themselves. I mean, you know, it's, it's, but it takes an efficient and capable regulator to notice when, you know, operators are not living up to, you know, the, the, the levels of, of, of or the quality of, of, of services that they're, they're meant to be, or they're not complying with the regulations or the guidelines that set them up. Um, so it's a good thing that we're going through the reaccreditation. It's a good thing that at the end of the, play, at the, end of the day, mm. the industry will be sanitized and there will be only credible operators left. The second important thing as well is that NHIS itself then got strengthened. You know, um, right now the governance system has been, you know, rebuilt in a way to, to, to match up to what the act that set it up requires. So there is also now, in addition to an executive secretary, there is a council and there is a chair of the council. 
And um, I do believe also that at the management level, at the top management level, it's been strengthened as well. So okay, so how would they move, how would they begin to approach issues now? When like I mean, you talk about I mean, who's regulating or who's checking the quality of services of these HMS if they are owing, who steps in? So should we expect that to happen? Oh, now? we expect that to happen. I mean, we've had a series of meetings as well with with um, the executive secretary okay. as well as his management staff and a couple also with the council members involved, and we are all determined to sanitize the industry. And I think it's very apparent that both sides are willing to work together. You know, um, there's no HMO that wants to be tied with a brush of other mm. non-performing or non-compliant HMOs. We all believe that the only HMOs who should remain and who should get accredited are those that are able to take the industry forward. So that was a good thing. Those are the two great outcomes that came mm. out of it. Okay, still on the, I mean, on the industry, health insurance. I mean, despite all the challenges, there are opportunities, and this oh, yeah. is a big market. Uh, 190, especially those who are outside of the, the nine to five and the white collar jumps. There's a huge market out there. So, do you think that I mean, it's still a good time for investors to come in and say, okay, want to set up an HM and take advantage of this market? I believe that it is because um, if you think about it, the federal civil servants right now make up more than 90 percent of, of the covered population. We still have state civil servants. And um, some states have tried to, to, to cover their, their civil servants, but none has done it to the level of success that will warrant the numbers being published. And when you don't see numbers published, mm -hmm. you tend to think, okay, so there's nothing to, to report that's significant yet. Um, but I'm very excited. Lagos State is about to start. Okay. And um, I believe that Lagos State will raise the bar and um, every other state will then try and emulate what Lagos State is, is, is going to do. So we're very much looking forward to that, to having state governments even cover their staff. So you can see the opportunity. Every state government in Nigeria covering all the civil servants in that state is a market that well, is huge. That is for the workforce. That's one yeah. huge market. That I'm thinking is, there's a bigger market and, outside of Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 coming, I'm okay. coming to that as well because many of the state governments also now want to make it compulsory. Even if oh, okay. at the federal level Level, there is not yet the legislation that makes it compulsory. When they do that as well, it opens up the market for private individuals to fall under some health plan or the other. I mean, Nigerian's population is massive. I know we say the middle income, if it still exists, is rapidly it's shrinking. Somewhere that is there somewhere. <laughs> but I agree with you, there's such a, you know, a vast number of individuals who are working on their own. We have a thriving informal economy. You know, you, in these days you have the event planners you have entertainers, you have um, people who are artisans as well. You have a teeming population of Nigerians who don't do a nine to five job and who still need health insurance cover. It's how to reach them and preach to them that this is something that you need and convert them. Um, that's taking us and, a bit of a time. And, that sounds, <laughs> and it sounds like a lot of work is like no regular insurance. So how do you begin to penetrate that market? I mean, it just sounds like a lot of work and a lot of money to invest in. You've just hit the nail on the head. It's a lot of money to invest in marketing and in distribution to those kind of people. And I mean, at Avon HMO, we're kind of making a dent in it. Um, we decided earlier on that because that presented the largest opportunity for growth for us. By the time we came on the scene, all the federal civil servants had been distributed more or less amongst the existing right. HMOs. So we didn't get any dinner given to us on a plate. We had to, we had to go <laughs> hunt, kill. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and, you know, we basically ate what we could hunt. Wow. So for us, that market has always been the market that we faced in addition to the corporate you know, segment of, of, of the market. And we've tried to reach them in places where they're at, you know, when they're on social media. So our plan, for instance, is we're the first people to offer, you know, Nigerians the opportunity to buy their health plan from their phone or any other mobile device for that matter. So we understand that in order to reach these people, the conventional routes to market are not going to work. So technology could be technology yeah, like, is like a game what the changer. banks are doing, yeah, doing it, all sorts of... It's, 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 a, it's a game market. changer for, for, for reaching this kind of number of people that but are, are we, so is that, is that Are we in the process of doing oh. that already? Is that already in motion? Oh, yes, indeed. We can now offer plans okay. on our phones from Avon HMO. So if you for wanted Avon, to buy... For Avon HMO. For Avon okay. HMO. If you wanted to buy a health plan now from Avon HMO, you could do it on your phone in three Minutes. Everything explained. Everything terms explained. And conditions, terms and easy conditions. To read and easy understand. to read and understand. You agree to it. You make your payment. So when you look at it, I mean the future, because I'm hoping we can get it right, and perhaps we may need at some point to go still go back to the drawing table and look at the document and see how that model can w better work for us as a country because our population is, is going to explode. Yeah. So, but what do you see when you look down the line, down 10, 20 years, us getting it right, and what shape do you think the industry would have taken? Okay, so if I look down the line, I see that, one, the most important oh. thing that I hope would have changed is people's behavior towards healthcare. 
and towards health insurance. Because right now we still have people of my generation and maybe a little bit below my generation believing that, you know what, I don't need to, you know, get a health insurance cover because I'm never going to be ill. I don't need to subscribe to a health plan. God forbid. It's not my portion. Same with the regular, exactly, regular insurance. Exactly. So, and living a healthy lifestyle and taking important all things pertaining to health hasn't really featured in, you know, our minds as we grew up. But the younger generation, we have the opportunity okay. to shape their own behavior and their thoughts around not just healthy living, but also getting a health cover and not having to pay out of pocket. So I think the kind of people we'll be dealing with 10 years from now are people who have grown up hearing this every day. So okay. they won't be hard to convert. Right. And the next thing is that, look, they exist in a world of technology, and that is the way to reach them. Simba, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. My Simba pleasure. Simba Okuri, CEO of Avon HMO, looking at Nigeria's healthcare systems. Well, that's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, you can watch our previous episodes of the show on our website, cnbcafrica.com. I'm Esther Awoni. Thank you for watching, and bye for now. Mm -hmm.